Okay, so we're going to talk about the functions of the spleen, and here are some of the functions uh, of those functions. In the fetus, uh, our spleen produces red blood cells. We lose that ability uh, sort of later um, in fetal development. The spleen uh, pulls a lot of blood into itself, just like the liver, and this can function as a blood reservoir, but this is thought to be clinically insignificant in humans. Um, if you compare it to the horse's spleen, which is a pretty huge organ, um, the horse, when in shock, uh, will have a flood of blood in going into its circulation from its spleen. Um, I suppose something similar happens in humans, uh, but the amount of blood pooled in the spleen is probably not terribly significant. The spleen functions as a blood filter, removing debris and foreign matter, uh, especially for the action of macrophages. The spleen produces and stores lymphocytes, especially our T memory cells. And the spleen uh, destroys damaged, old, and abnormal red blood cells. And the spleen also recycles iron from uh, uh, from red blood cells. I'm going to discuss uh, a few of these things in a bit more detail in the next few slides. Okay, so the spleen is divided into white pulp and red pulp, and uh, it's almost as if the functions of the spleen are divided between these two colors of pulp. Uh, we have all these branching arterial vessels going through uh, the spleen, and um, these arteries feed into venous sinuses, and this is referred to as the red pulp. There's lots of connective tissue all around uh, this vasculature, and uh, there is lymphoid tissue uh, embedded in the connective tissue, and that's referred to as our white pulp. And our white pulp is quite macrophage ri rich. In fact, about 15% of all our macrophages are actually in the spleen. <coughs> okay, so uh, with regards to the red pulp, we've got our arterial blood, it arrives into that connective tissue, and this connective tissue forms cords of fibroblasts and reticular fibers. Uh, which in and of itself forms a blood system. These cords are macrophage rich. Uh, and then from, so what happens is that blood goes from the arterial blood into the cord, uh, sort of um, endothelial system, and then enters into the venous sinuses or the red pulp. And these sinuses are unique um, in the sense they have a discontinuous endothelial lining. Now most of the endothelium in our vasculature or to be smooth and consistent without openings. The venous sinuses in the um, spleen are an exception. They have openings, slit-like openings, which are referred to as fenestrations. Um, and these openings are regulated by some fibers, consist of actin and, my and myosin, so these guys can, uh, can contract and open up to allow these openings to close up and open up as necessary. And these filaments of myosin and actin also attach this, these um, venous sinuses to the connective tissue uh, to our cords. So what happens, um, only red blood cells that have flexible uh, membranes can pass through these uh, slit-like openings uh, in the uh, venous sinuses. Um, old erythrocytes no longer have flexible membranes, they get stuck in the connective tissue. Um, abnormal erythrocytes have abnormal membranes uh, that prevent them from uh, flexing through into the venous sinus become stuck. They're stuck in the cords. We've mentioned the cords are macrophage rich. The macrophage come and they gobble up um, these uh, erythrocytes through phagocytosis. Here's a drawing just to illustrate that. We've got our blood coming in from the arterioles. As mentioned, uh, there's white pulp, uh, lymphoid tissue. We've got our cords, which uh, is connective tissue, uh, rich with macrophages, and blood enters through this art little tiny arteriole and uh, diffuses through the endothelial system in the, c in the cords to enter the venous sinus um, and, in and this is where all that filtration uh, occurs and then that blood goes off. Okay, so now we're zooming into a venous sinus and we see that this endothelium has openings or fenestrations in it. It's not a continuous endothelium, unlike in other blood vessels. And we have some annular rings that sort of keep the um, endothelium uh, from drifting apart because of all these openings. And we have our red blood cells 
desperately squeezing themselves in through these openings to try and escape the evil macrovages that uh, swim around on the outside of the venue of sinus and those poor suckers are not able to get in and let's say this poor guy gets stuck there and the macrophage will come and gobble it up uh, thus ending its life okay so uh, what happens to the iron in our red blood cells from that hemoglobin once it's phagocytosed. Uh, well, iron from these phagocytosed erythrocytes um, is stored in the macrophages or else released as ferritin or alternatively as a low molecular weight molecule that binds to transference. There's a whole bunch of these type of molecules so I'm um, think to really knows I can really we really need to know is that it binds to transferrin which is our transport protein for iron um, which, uh, but what about uh, red blood cells that die sort of elsewhere in the body? Not all red blood cells make it to to die in, a, in the belly of a macrophage in the spleen. Some of them die elsewhere in the body um, and they degrade elsewhere in the body and they release hemoglobin. Well that hemoglobin is uh, bound by haptoglobin and this sort of a complex molecule uh, ends up in the spleen and is also absorbed by the macrophages and they will then recycle the iron by releasing it as ferritin or um, as something that can bind to transferrin or alternatively store it. And this is important because um, free iron in the body is used up by bacteria uh, so this sort of combining and then absorption by macrophages prevents free iron from being readily available uh, for bacterial growth. Not only that, but when uh, splenic macrophages um, detect a bacterial infection uh, in, in the bloodstream, they will secrete um, siderophores, which are iron absorption inhibitors, and that furthermore, uh, uh, these siderophores will um, uh, furthermore block uh, bacterial iron intake what happens is these siderophores actually uh, sit in the iron absorption channels of bacteria and make it difficult for the bacteria to absorb iron. So sort of uh, through these two mechanisms um, uh, iron is harvested for the body's use rather than for opportunistic pathogens. Okay, so the spleen can be thought of being as a uh, of being an organ in the of the immune system. And why is that? Well, I've got well, our B cells um, are sort of more Advanced B cells, our plasma blasts and our plasma cells, will lodge in the red pulp and they then continuously secrete antibodies directly into the bloodstream. Um, so it's almost sort of like uh, in, uh, as lymph nodes. B cells also lodge in lymph nodes and secrete antibodies directly into the lymph. However, this goes one step further and allows them to secrete directly into the blood. And then we've got T and B cells uh, lodging in our white pulp, in that lymphoid tissue. Um, and they react to pathogens just as they do in lymph nodes. Um, this is very similar to um, lymph uh, node tissue. And, uh, and they um, react to pathogens in the blood that filters through. Of course, the macrophages don't eat red blood cells only. Um, they also phagocytose pathogens that are stranded in the cords. And these are my references. This is a really good review article of the spleen that goes into much more detail than I've gone into this lecture if you are by any chance fascinated by the functions of the spleen.